Hello, and welcome to the B2IP webinar series, hosted by Bijan Bienemann. Bijan Bienemann is a boutique intellectual property law firm based out of Southeast Michigan. I'm Peter Kiros, and today my colleague Brian Hart will be discussing definiteness and damages in design patent law, so, and some recent changes in the law. Today's webinar has been approved for CLE credit in several states. In the middle of the presentation, we will announce a polling question that will show up on your screen. If you are seeking CLD credit, please be sure to answer the question before the presentation concludes. On your screen, you will find a Q&A and chat feature. Please leave all questions in either of these boxes and we will answer them at the end. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy the presentation. All right, so I'll be covering two uh, decisions. The first one is the Federal Circuit's decision in Inri Matita, and that one's the one that dealt with definiteness that came out just last fall. The other one is Samsung versus Apple which came out from the Supreme Court in 2016, as well as a couple district court cases that have come out since uh, the Samsung decision. Uh, but since our audience may have some varied exposure to the topic of design patents, I'll start with just some basics having to do with design patents. And this is just to make sure that everyone starts on the same page when we go through the cases. Uh, so what is a design patent? Uh, design patents cover the ornamental design of a functional item. So this can overlap a bit with other areas of intellectual property. Uh, utility patents cover roughly the functional design of functional items, how something works. Uh, design patents instead cover the appearance of a product, not the functionality of that product. The of a functional item part of what a design patent is, is what kind of separates design patents from copyrights, although it, they can overlap. Uh, copyrights cover ornamental designs of generally of things that are not functional items. So a painting, for example, is going to be covered by copyright but not design patents. The subject matter of design patents is broken down this way. Uh, these are basically the categories of design patents from, from the manual for patent examining procedure. First, a design for an ornament, impression, print, or picture applied to or embodied in an article of manufacture. This is basically the surface stuff put on top of some product. So it might be the design on a rug or wallpaper. It could be the graphic on a, on a mug or things like that. Uh, second is the shape or configuration of an article of manufacture. Some examples here could be like an action figure or a chair or maybe the shape of the handle on a mug. Uh, third, there can be designs that incorporate aspects of both that have configuration as well as surface ornamentation, so a mug with a weird handle and a graphic on it. Uh, so here's an example of a design patent, number D837484, entitled Inflatable Baby Costume. The design patent itself, as in the actual document, is going to have mostly the same components as a utility patent has. Title, inventor, assignee, number, classification codes, and so on. Uh, if the number starts with a D, then you know you are looking at a design patent and not a utility patent. One big important difference between utility patents and design patents is how, is how the claiming works. Uh, so design patents always just have one claim, and it must follow this format the ornamental design for blank as shown. Or it could also be the ornamental design for blank as shown and described. Uh, so in our example, the claim says the ornamental design for an inflatable baby costume as shown and described. The requirements for getting a design patent include all the same requirements as utility patents. So novelty, it has to be new. Non-obviousness, it shouldn't be a combination of prior designs that any schmo could have put together. Definiteness is what we're going to be covering in detail once we get to in Matita. Uh, enablement, someone of skill in the art has to be able to make the design, as well as the other requirements that apply to utility patents. One additional requirement that applies just to design patents is ornamentality. This requirement is that the design has to be about the appearance of a product not about the functionality of the product. The test for ornamentality is that, one, the design has to be visible, in other words, not hidden on the inside of the product, and two, there has to be another way to perform whatever function that design performs. 
Uh, oh, there are a lot of designs out there that can, when you look at them, feel much more functional than, orna than ornamental. But they, but they will often still satisfy this test for ornamentality, just as long as there's at least some, at least one other way out there to do that function. Uh, so liability for infringement is another area in which the same requirements apply for utility patents and design patents. They both rely on Section 271 of Title 35. So a design patent holder can sue for direct infringement, contributory infringement, inducement to infringe, and all the other theories that appear in Section 271. So as I just mentioned, every single design patent claim includes the words as shown. So claiming something as shown means that the drawings are absolutely required for design patents. They're not just exemplary illustrations like they are for utility patents. The drawings are part of the claim. And the particulars of the drawings are used to define the scope of the claim. The most important way to control the scope of the claim is with how the lines in the drawings are drawn. You can use solid lines and you can use dotted lines. Solid, solid lines put something within the scope of the claim. When you use solid lines, you're saying, this is the design, this is what I am claiming. Dotted lines, on the other hand, put something outside the scope of the claim. When you use dotted lines, you're saying, this is just for context, don't hold me to this. And you don't just need to include drawings, you need to include enough drawings. Uh, in particular, what the MPEP says is that you must include a sufficient number of views for a complete disclosure. So our example here, the inflatable baby costume, uh, has seven views. So these views can be seen here. There's, pers there's perspective view, front, back, right, left, top and bottom. Um, so this inflatable baby costume is basically nightmare fuel, but at least it is well illustrated nightmare fuel. All right, so with these basics under our belt, we can jump into the first case in Rematita. The topic at issue in Matita was definiteness. So the same provision for definiteness applies to both utility patents and design patents. So for those listeners who are patent lawyers, this should be very familiar language. The description has to have such full, clear, concise, and exact terms to describe how to make the invention to any person skilled in the art. And the claims must particularly point out and distinctly claim the invention. May be the same provisions as for utility patents, but now they're being applied to claims that are made of pictures instead of claims that are made of words. So how do we make that switch from words to pictures? It's not, like when you think about it, it's not really that straightforward. All right, so before we jump into the court's reasoning, let's get some background on the case so that we have enough context. The case here comes from an application for a design on a shoe bottom. The claim reads, the ornamental design for a shoe bottom as shown and described. There are two drawings. Both of the drawings are bottom views, the view of the ground looking up at the sole of the shoe, like you see here. The difference between the two drawings are just which parts are shown in solid lines and which parts are shown in dotted lines. Essentially, the two bottom views are showing different embodiments of the design. Uh, for our purposes, we can just ignore the second figure. Uh, having multiple embodiments in the same application is fine. The important thing here is that there's just one view, just the bottom view. So for the view here in figure one, uh, the solid line parts are concentrated here. And this is what the claimed design is, just kind of this section of the shoe bottom. The rest of the shoe bottom is in broken lines, and in theory it could be anything. Uh, so this aspect is also unremarkable. You're allowed to claim just part of the overall product. In this case, you are allowed to claim just part of the shoe bottom. So what's unusual here, like I was just saying, is that there are no views other than the bottom view. No perspective view, no front view, no side view, just the bottom view. All right, so that's what was in the application. So now let's cover the timeline of events. First, this application with just the bottom view was sent to the patent office, and the examiner rejected it for being indefinite. Uh, the applicant filed a response arguing against the rejection. 
the argument was that someone with skill in the art could look at the at those plan views and then make a product satisfying one of them. There's no problem with a designer of ordinary skill in the art picking up the application and figuring out whether a design would be covered by the figures or not covered by the figures. And that's what definiteness is supposed to be about, whether a person of skill in the art would understand the scope of the claims. If there are different interpretations of the figures, but someone could understand all of those interpretations, then that's just what the scope of the claim is. The claim just covers all of those interpretations. Basically, a person of skill in the art would still understand what fell within the scope of the, the drawings. Uh, the examiner did not buy that argument. The examiner maintained the rejection, and since this is the second action, uh, the, the rejection is now final rejection. Now, to make the point a little clearer, in the second rejection, the examiner included these pictures. According to the examiner, the design might be any one of these pictures. How would someone reading the patent know which one it is? Maybe the, maybe the features go into the shoe, maybe they come out of the shoe, maybe they're just flat like in the lower left picture, who knows? So implicit in what the examiner is saying is that these four pictures are all different designs. If the application had had all of these pictures listed as figures to begin with, then it would have had a restriction applied to it. The patent office would have forced the applicant to pursue all of these separate applications leading to potentially leading to separate patents. They're just too different from each other to be embodiments of a single design. And a person of skill in the art would not have known which of these different designs the applicant here was claiming because the figures don't show whether the features of the shoe sole go into the shoe or come out of the shoe. So the rejection was upheld. Now, naturally the applicant is unhappy with this result and they decide to appeal. And so now the Federal Circuit gets to decide how to apply definiteness to design patents. This is not an issue that the Federal Circuit has decided before. Uh, here is a quote from the opinion that lays out what indefiniteness is for design patents. This is now the, the black letter law for this issue. And I'm going to read the standard and then unpack it a bit because what the court is doing here is frankly pretty confusing. So here's the standard that the court articulates. A design patent is indefinite under Section 112 if one, if one skilled in the art, viewing the design as would an ordinary observer, would not understand the scope of the design with reasonable certainty based on the claim and official disclosure. So did he catch that? The perspective is a person skilled in the art pretending to be someone not skilled in the art. That is weird. The underlying reason for this standard is that the purpose of definiteness is to give notice of what will infringe. And the infringement standard for design patents is the ordinary observer test. Basically, if an ordinary observer would look at a product and think that it's the same thing as the patented design, then that product infringes the design. But the standard for definiteness is generally measured with respect to a person of skill in the art. That's just from the statutory language. The presumed audience of a patent, both utility patent and or design patent, is someone else in the same field as that patent. Uh, that's who's motivated to actually read a patent. So when you cram those two standards together, what you get is this test. A person in the same field as the patent reads the patent to decide whether or not they infringe, and to decide whether they infringe, they pretend to be an ordinary observer. Therefore, the standard is a person of skill in the art acting as an ordinary observer, reading the patent, determining if the scope is reasonably certain. Uh, next, how did the court apply that standard here to the question of the number of views provided of the design? If the design is the type of thing that's normally shown two-dimensionally, then one view is good enough. If it's the type of design that's normally shown in three dimensions, then you need more than just one view. The court thinks that a shoe bottom is the type of design that is normally understood two-dimensionally, not three-dimensionally. Now, in real life, there is no such thing as a purely two-dimensional object. Everything has some sort of thickness to it, even a piece of paper. What makes a two-dimensional design only two-dimensional is that the thickness part of it is not thought of as part of the design. 
So the court gives the example of a rug. A rug can be high pile or low pile, thick or thin, basically. Now, if you copy a rug design, but you make the rug high pile instead of low pile, it's still the same design. The thickness is just kind of beside the point. And that's, that's what it means for a design to be capable of being disclosed and judged from a two-dimensional perspective. Uh, and then the court puts a shoe bottom into this two-dimensional category. You know, whether the features go into or out of the page, whether the features are convex or concave, doesn't matter. It's still the same design, and someone reading the patent would understand the scope of that design to cover any combination of the features going into or out of the page. So the definiteness standard has been met, and the patent office must overturn its rejection. Uh, to fully understand this standard, let's think counterfactually. What would have happened if the court had gone the other way on that last point? So what if the, sh what if the design had been a shoe instead of a shoe bottom? So now it's something that is inherently three-dimensional. In that case, you do have to include multiple views, not just one view. Uh, also, there cannot be inconsistencies between different views of the same embodiment. If there are inconsistencies, then how does a person reading the patent know what the design covers? Does it cover the version shown in figure one or in figure two? Now, this is not an absolute rule. Some differences between the views are allowable as long as they show multiple embodiments of the same design. An example of something that is just different embodiments might be some feature that is present in some views and absent in other views, but the feature isn't particularly big or important. You know, different embodiments of the same design are okay and still count as definite. Now, if the difference between the figures rise to the level of being different designs, then it becomes not okay, then it becomes indefinite. If you're thinking that it's kind of fuzzy whether something is different embodiments of the same design or different designs entirely, well, you would be right. So the reaction to this case from the, from the commentariat was not that positive. There was a lot of, there was a lot of head scratching. Uh, even if you accept this distinction that the court made between designs that are inherently two-dimensional and designs that are inherently three-dimensional, why is a shoe sole something that's inherently 2D instead of 3D? Most people's intuitions tend to cut the other way. People think of a shoe bottom as a three-dimensional thing. Uh, so Dennis Crouch, I would guess a lot of you are familiar with, he writes the Patent Leo blog, and he's also a professor at Missouri's Law School. Uh, he called the standard weird cosplay to sort of highlight how baffling the test is. So the person of skill in the art is essentially dressing up as an ordinary observer. Essentially, the judge is piling, uh, the panel is piling one legal fiction on top of another contradictory legal fiction. Uh, Sarah Burstein is a law professor that focuses her work specifically on design patents. Uh, part of my prep for this web webinar was reading some of her articles. She's a good resource for clarifying and teasing apart concepts in this field. She thinks that where the court went wrong is confusing surface ornamentation designs with configuration designs. So remember in the first slide, we talked about the kinds of subject matter of design patents. The subject matter could be a surface ornamentation on some product, or it can be the configuration of a product. This is a useful way to think about, think about this topic because it shows why people had the intuition that a shoe bottom is three-dimensional. The shoe bottom is, is more of a configuration of the product, not a surface ornamentation of the product. So that's, that's why the uh, court's result seems so weird. Uh, but regardless of what the commentators say, this case is binding law, unless you're arguing before an en banc federal circuit panel. Uh, so as practitioners, how should we handle this case? So first, if you have a design for a shoe sole bottom, you can feel pretty good about submitting just a plan view for that design. That would fall within the narrowest possible interpretation of this case. Uh, second, if your design is something that is flat-ish, so mostly flat, but maybe some of people would think it's not all that flat, 
then you, then you should consider submitting just a plan view. Uh, whether you ultimately submit just, a, just one plan view or a full complement of views is going to depend on a trade-off. So on the one hand, there is the risk that the, that the patent office classifies the design as three-dimensional and rejects the application as indefinite. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. On the other hand, if the patent office gr agrees that the design is two-dimensional, then you will get a much broader scope. So the main benefit of going with just the one view is the breadth. It covers, you know, if you have just the one view, then it's going to cover every combination of each feature going into the page or coming out of the page or being flat. So that just kind of just comes down to a risk-reward decision. All right, so third, what about if you are in litigation on the other side of a design patent? with just one view. You're the defendant and the plaintiff has essentially taken advantage of this ruling and has a design patent with just one view in it. You can still argue that the design patent in question is inherently three-dimensional and that uh, if it succeeds is going to distinguish the result in, in this case. And the, the counterintuitiveness of this case helps here. So, you know, maybe there is some argument that's to analogize whatever the design patent is to a shoe bottom. Uh, but if a design kind of just feels three-dimensional, then judges are probably going to want to classify it as three-dimensional. So you've got, some, you've got some room to work with when you're making your arguments in that case. All right, and so that's, that's one of our two cases. Before we move on, we'll uh, briefly pause for our CLE check. So you've got our question in, in front of us. You can fill that out at some point in the rest of this presentation. The correct answer is Michigan. You can tell because it's the only answer. All right, so now on to our second case, uh, Samsung versus Apple. So in, in Re Matita was the federal circuit, and now we're dealing with the Supreme Court. Uh, the last time that the Supreme Court decided a design patent case was in 1894. That was the case of Dunlap versus Schofield. So to put that length of time in perspective, Halley's Comet has passed by the Earth on its orbit twice between the Dunlap case and the Samsung case. Uh, Halley's Comet has a 75-year orbit that passed the Earth, near the Earth in 1910 and in 1986. That was only three back in 1986, so I'm really looking forward to seeing it when it comes around again in 2061, probably before the Supreme Court handles another design patent case. So this case is about damages. How much money is a plaintiff going to get if it wins? So a plaintiff asserting a design patent has two options for damages. The plaintiff can use Section 284, that's the same provision as for utility patents. So compensatory damages, no less than a reasonable royalty, et cetera. It's a well-developed area of law, and that area of law is equally available for design patents and for utility patents. The other option for the plaintiff is Section 289, which is exclusively for design patents. It cannot be used for utility patents. And Section 289 is what the court is interpreting in this case. This is a statutory interpretation case, so here's the statutory text. Whoever sells or exposes for sale any article of manufacture to which such design or colorful imitation has been applied shall be liable to the owner to the extent of his total profit. So in other words, there is an article of manufacture that infringes a design patent, and the plaintiff gets all the profits that the defendant made on that article of manufacture. Uh, this provision was passed in the 1880s in response to another earlier Supreme Court decision that required a showing of causation for, for design patent damages. What that means is the plaintiff would have had to show that they would have made some amount of money except that the defendant infringed their patents. And it was the defendant infringing their patent that caused them to, to lose out on, on that amount of money. And that resulted in some low, very low judgments, and Congress did not like that result. They thought 
these, these judgments are pretty much worthless. We need to do something to fix this. So they passed this law to, and the language in this section has not changed since it was passed. This is the, the same language is active now as was active in the 1880s. Uh, to give some background on this case, what it was all about was the iPhone. You remember the iPhone, the first one, what a big deal that was. So that was introduced more than 10 years ago now. And at the time, everybody went nuts. Steve Jobs was a genius, et cetera, et cetera. And during that very first introduction, Jobs made a comment uh, on the intellectual property protection they had acquired related to the iPhone. Boy, did we patent it. That is an exact quote. And so here are the design patents that uh, Apple asserted in this case. When you're looking at these, remember, solid lines are part of the design, dotted lines are not part of the design. So the patent on the left covers the rectangular bevel defining the shape of the phone, uh, along with the home button. Those are the solid line parts. You can see the screen is dotted lines, the kind of rest of the phone is, is dotted lines there. The patent in the middle covers the screen layout with the rows and columns of icons. And the patent on the right uh, covers the glass panel that takes up the whole front of the phone uh, with, along with the screen underneath. You can kind of see the shading shows that that's the material as part of the design. And you know that, that part, that's part of what made the iPhone so cool. It's got this big sleek panel and screen without a number pad or anything cluttering it up is just so minimalist. So Samsung came out with its own smartphones and Apple thought that they were just a bit too close. So it sued for infringement of those three design patents along with some utility patents and some other intellectual property like trade dress. So that suit was in Apple's home district, the Northern District of California. Samsung then files uh, three patent infringement suits in three different countries, including its home base of Korea. Samsung follows that with another three suits in three other countries. Apple files a few international suits of its own, uh, plus another suit in the U.S. So this is this is what's called a patent war. Like this, is two two heavyweights going at it. So the first suit goes to trial, and things go Apple's way. The jury finds that. Samsung infringed Apple's utility patents, trade dress, and design patents. So, but our, our topic's not liability. We are concerned about damages. The question for us is, how much did Apple get? So there were some motions and some wrangling over the damages, including a partial retrial about just the damages. But the bottom line for us is that Apple got almost $400 million for just those three design patents, just the ones that I showed earlier. So the first step, step on the way to the Supreme Court is the Federal Circuit. And the Federal Circuit upheld the award. Uh, Sam, Samsung tried to argue causation, basically tried to argue that Samsung's use of the design did not cause Apple to lose $400 million. It could not possibly have caused that much damage. Um, they're kind of trying to rely on, on the intuition that this award is, is just too big. Uh, but you know, kind of as we covered earlier, the history of the statute really cuts against that, against causation being, being a requirement. You know, the legislative history of the statute shows that Congress wanted to remove causation as a requirement. So that, that argument was a loser. Uh, Samsung also pointed to a case in 1915 that awarded profits for a design on a piano case, separate from profits on the pianos. You know, this was to show that the damages were not on the whole product, just on a component of the product. So this case is about what counts as the article of manufacture in the statute. Samsung was trying to show that if the product has multiple compo components, then one of those components can be the article of manufacture, and the total profits is measured just from that component, not from the product as a whole. Uh, but the Federal Circuit distinguished that case uh, because piano cases, you know, at that time were sold as separate products from the piano. 
you could walk into a store and just buy a piano case without having to buy a piano. Right? So the piano case is not a component of a multi-component product. The piano case just is the product. All right, so here's the kind of the money quote from the Federal Circuit's decision. The innards of Samsung's smartphones were not sold separately from their shells as distinct articles of manufacture to ordinary purchasers. Right, so the standard is essentially what is the, the thing that is being sold to consumers? Whatever that thing is, that's the article of manufacture. And the damages are the total profit on that thing that is being sold to the consumers. So in this case, that's the phones. It's not the phone cases or, or other subparts of the phone. So Samsung appeals for cert to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decides to hear the case. So here are, first we'll cover uh, Apple's arguments to the Supreme Court. So first argument is that there were a lot of design patents on multi-component products that come from the same time period as the statute itself or shortly before, roughly 1870s to 1880s. You know, the, the implication is that the article of manufacture can be an entire multi-component product. You know, there, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the arguments in this case were kind of going back to, you know, and statutory interpretation of something written in the 1880s, how were people using that term in the 1880s? So this is one piece of evidence toward how people were using the term article of manufacture around the time that the statute was written. Uh, second, the statute says total. The word total is in there in front of profits. So you're supposed to get the total profits. When Congress passed the law, they were worried about undercounting, not about overcounting. So, and total is a pretty strong word, and it implies that you know what what the statute is doing should be a pretty sweeping measurement of the damages. Uh, third. Congress passed a bunch of changes to the patent statutes between the 1880s and now. There was, you know, the America Invents Act. Recently, there was the big, there was the big overhaul of the Patent Act in 1952. You know, in, in any of those legislative changes to the Patent Act, they could have changed the phrasing of this provision, but they chose not to. It's the same wording now as it was back in the 1880s. And if Congress was worried about the type of outcome that happened in, the, in this case, they could have acted to fix it. They had ample opportunity in the last, you know, more than a century. Uh, fourth, Apple tries to claim that Samsung waived this argument at the district court. Uh, this has to do with the motion practice around the jury instructions. Basically, Apple is saying, Samsung needed to have raised this point uh, when we were talking about the jury instructions before the district court. They didn't raise this point then, and because they failed to do so, they did not preserve this argument. All right, so Samsung has its own arguments to the court. Uh, first, they decide that the causation argument is a loser, and they drop that one, which is wise. So their, their first actual argument is that, you know, from their own research in the archives, they can point to contempt patents from around the time of the statute or earlier that cover just components of multi-component products. So that means that the term article of manufacture can refer to just one component of a bigger product. One example is patents on stove segments uh, back from the time when stoves were a really big deal, you know, not just for cooking food, they're also for heating your home, uh, back in the 1840s. You know, there, the example shown on this slide is a teapot uh, from the 1890s, and you can see that the, the handle and the lid are excluded from the design. So they're, they're drawn with dotted lines, and this is roughly when the patent office starts allowing people to do that trick with the dotted lines to exclude subject matter. So it's showing here that it's just part of this uh, teapot that's being claimed. Uh, second, 
Samsung points to how broad the contemporaneous definitions of article of article of manufacture were. Uh, so there's they're pointing to kind of definitions from dictionaries published around that time, as well as from statutes uh, that have that are for completely different areas of the law outside of patent law. It's areas like the the act having to do with tariffs, uh, kind of used language like that, and their definition was very broad. And you know, essentially saying the, all of these definitions are how people understood the word at the time. And these definitions are broad enough to encompass just a component of a multi-component product. You know, kind of third and finally, uh, Samsung, you know, trots out the policy arguments, the parade of horribles, the list of all of the awful consequences of deciding against Samsung in this case. You know, basic gist of it is that this award is huge. And everyone else is going to look at this award and think, I have a design patent. Can I get a piece of that? There will be disproportionate awards. A plaintiff can get multiple recoveries for the same product. There will be patent trolls, but now they're going to use design patents instead of utility patents. Uh, there will be a whole bunch of new cases filed, mass hysteria, dogs and cats living together. You get the picture. Uh, the Supreme Court went with Samsung and reversed the Federal Circuit. Uh, unlike a lot of contentious issues, uh, the, the court found this one pretty easy to decide. So it was a unanimous decision. It was only 11 pages long, no, no, not only no dissents, but no concurrences either. Uh, it was issued closer to the beginning of the Supreme Court's term, which shows that there wasn't much haggling over the case inside the court. It's always the the difficult cases kind of get pushed to the end of the term. The easy ones come out earlier. Um, so, I mean, and that's not necessarily too much of a surprise. The Supreme Court does like overturning the Federal Circuit. So the focus of the Supreme Court's decision was statutory interpretation of article of manufacture. And what the court found most persuasive was the various definitions of article of manufacture from around the time of the statute. Uh, these definitions all tended to be pretty broad and broad enough to cover a multi-component product as a whole or or just one component of a multi-component product. It could, the, the definition is broad enough to cover both of those situations. You know, and this shows that people at the time of, of the, that the statute was enacted would have under, would have understood the term to be broad enough to cover just the one component of a, of a larger product. Uh, there were also examples of courts and the patent office referring to components of multi-component products as articles of manufacture. That was additional evidence to the general public understanding of the term at the time that the statute was enacted. Um, so in this case, it means that it is possible that the phone shell by itself could be an artic article of manufacture separate from the phone's guts. The court doesn't actually decide that, they just decide that that is a possible outcome. Uh, so based on that interpretation of the statute, here is the test that the court laid out. Uh, first, identify the article of manufacture to which the infringed design has been applied. Uh, second, calculate the infringer's total profits made on that article of manufacture. So that seems pretty simple, right? Uh, but the test does leave a little something to be desired. How do you do step one? How do you figure out what the article of manufacture is? The whole point of this litigation was disagreement over what the article of manufacture was. Was it the whole phone or was it just the phone case? And the court punted on providing any reasoning on the key issue in the case. All right, so the Supreme Court left us with basically nothing about what the test should be. Um, however, there was some discussion in the briefing about what the test for article of manufacture should look like. All right, so here is the test uh, proposed by the Solicitor General. So like in a lot of Supreme Court cases, the court requested that the government give its opinion in addition to Apple and Samsung. You know, the government is essentially acting as a 
third party to the case and submitting briefs and getting time and oral argument. All right, and so we'll, we'll get to this in a couple slides, but the, the reason that this test that they lay out is important is because courts have started using it. All right, so what, actually looking at the test, you know, there isn't, a, there isn't any sort of firm rule, it's just factors, it's just things to take into account when you're trying to figure out what the article of manufacture is. So the first factor is the scope of the claimed design. For example, is it a shoe or is it a shoe sole? Uh, this can include how the article is designated in the claim. So, the, you know, the claim is phrased, an, or an ornamental design for blank as shown. And so what fills in the blank in, in the claim is part of the evidence in this factor. But it's not, it's not conclusive, it's just part of the evidence. Um, another part of uh, this factor is how much of the article is actually the design. So how much, how much of the product shown in the figures is the solid lines versus the dotted lines. The second factor is the prominence of the design in the product as a whole. So if what the design patent covers is most of the product's appearance, that cuts in favor of saying that the whole product is the article of manufacture. Um, if, if it's just a little part, then that cuts against it. Uh, the third factor is whether the design is conceptually distinct from the product as a whole. Uh, so one way to think about this one is whether other types of IP cover other aspects of the, of the product. Um, the Solicitor General's brief gives an example of a book binding versus the literary work uh, inside the book. So in that case, it's kind of design patent versus copyright. You know, the, the aspect of it covered by the copyright is, you know, is kind of something else. And so if most of the value is that, then it's then that would kind of be in favor of just the components, not the product as a whole. You know, another possibility is the design patent aspects of a product versus the utility patent aspects of a product. If people really value a product because of what it does and not really how it looks, then that's going to cut against having the uh, assigning the total profits from the design of the product as a whole. So the and the fourth and the last factor is the physical relationship of the design uh, and the rest of the product. So basically, is the component that the design covers physically detachable from the rest of the product? Could you, even if it's, could you take it apart and have it be separate than the rest of the product? Um, so Apple and Samsung both criticized the government's test but they did not propose their own tests. And this, this is at least part of why the Supreme Court did not really create a test for what the article of manufacture is, is because there wasn't any real adversarial argument about what the test should be. Apple and Samsung punted on what the test should be, and so that's a big reason why the court punted on what the test should be. But in any event, uh, the Solicitor General's test is the only test to come out of this case. So the Supreme Court uh, determined that the entire phone is not necessarily the article of manufacture, uh, but since they didn't even specify a test, they also did not decide what the article of manufacture actually was. Uh, they did not decide that it was just the phone case, they decided that it could be just the phone case. Right, and so they you know, the Supreme Court remands it to the Federal Circuit to figure out. And so what does the Federal Circuit do? Remand it to the District Court for the District Court to figure out. And the District Court does not have anyone else that it can remand the case to, so it actually has to figure out what the test should be. And the Northern District of California, in this case, uh, decided to use the Solicitor General's test. Uh, the judge does not decide what the article of manufacture is. There, there was no summary judgment. It got you know, that issue got sent to the jury and the text of the jury instructions were based on the Solicitor General's test. And here is where things get a little surprising. Uh, 
as the result of this jury retrial is that Apple got more money than they got in the first trial. So at the first trial, remember, Apple got $400 million. Samsung fought this case all the way to the Supreme Court to get a do-over on this trial, and they get it, and now they've got their chance to argue in front of the jury again, and then the jury socks them for over $100 million more than they awarded before, well over $500 million now. And so after this, Apple and Samsung decide that they are finally tired of all the fighting, and they agree to a worldwide settlement. So all of, the, all of those cases around the world, all of them were settled at once. Upshot for us is that the, this, that Samsung versus Apple is not going to be the vehicle for the federal circuit to have to decide what the, what the test for the article of manufacture is. Right, so the last uh, important development for us to cover is that two other district courts have addressed this issue. Uh, the first case is Columbia Sportswear versus Cirrus Innovative Pro Accessories. Um, so this case has to do with the lining in various articles of winter clothing. Uh, the, so the, you see some of the figures here. The design is directed to you know, that wa the wavy line pattern that you can see on the linings of all of these things. That's, that's what the design pattern in this case was about. You know, and in this case, the, the judge sends it to the jury and, you know, like, like, in, uh, like with the uh, Apple Samsung jury, the judge uses the Solicitor General's test to formulate the jury instructions. Uh, Columbia won on liability. They, you know, it, was, it was found that Cirrus uh, infringed the, uh, the patents over this lining. Uh, and in terms of damages, uh, Columbia got the profits for all of the winter clothing articles as a whole, not not just kind of not just profits on the linings taken by themselves. So the the verdict form that the jury filled out did not have a blank for identifying the article of manufacture, so we can't see exactly what the jury said the article of manufacture was. But the the number they wrote down was what Columbia's damages expert told them to write down. So we, we can assume that they agreed with Columbia's damages expert about what the article of manufacture was. And that damage that damages expert said, the article of manufacture is the whole thing. All right. Uh, so the second of these two cases is uh, Nordoc versus Systems Incorporated. So this case has to do with a dock leveler, like for when you're unloading a truck onto a loading platform or, or something like that. So this case had an earlier verdict, and that was appealed, and you know went up to the federal circuit. It was they applied for cert to the Supreme Court. Uh, Supreme Court granted did did what's called a GVR grant vacate remand. So they granted cert, uh, vacated the ruling, sent it back to the federal circuit with the instructions reconsider this in light of Samsung versus Apple with that being the only, only substance that the Supreme Court added. So then the Federal Circuit looked at that and uh, just sent it back down to the district court. And so right now what's happening is that there is a retrial for damages that is pending. And the, the court has denied summary judgment on, on what the article of manufacturing is, saying it's a fact-bound question, it's got to go to the jury. And like in the other two cases, the court has ruled that it's going to use the Solicitor General's test for the jury instructions. So that, that retrial has not happened yet. Um, and I'm not aware of any other district courts that have used a different test than the Solicitor General's test. And this issue has not yet risen back to the Federal Circuit for any sort of precedential ruling. Presumably at some point they're going to have to deal with it, but they've avoided it so far. So in the meantime, kind of the existing precedent that is out there is three district courts using the Solicitor General's test. All right, so, so how should we handle this damages issue? Uh, at the most basic level, uh, the case can prevent 
uh, outcomes that kind of seem crazy. That was kind of why Samsung thought and fought so hard as they, they thought the intuition was on their side on this. And so you don't get to get the total profit for a car on a design for a cup holder inside of the car. Now, as the retrial for Apple shows, this is protection against a crazy theory, but not necessarily against a crazy dollar amount. So the second point is that there still isn't a binding test. There's still a lot of uncertainty out there. Now, the Federal Circuit may be forced to address this issue soon, or maybe they can just issue non-precedential rulings affirming uh, the district courts and avoid it for a while. Now, if the Columbia NORDOC case is settled too, that helps the Federal Circuit avoid it for a bit, and we'll just be left looking at these district court decisions for a while longer. So as the district court cases have shown, uh, the Solicitor General's test has had an anchoring effect. So it's, it's maybe not the best test, but it is the only test, and that seems to count for something. Now, if this issue comes up for you, like if you end up in a design patent litigation, you're going to have to address the Solicitor General's test somehow. If you think that the test cuts in your favor, uh, you have some persuasive authority on your side. There's all those district court decisions. If you think that the test cuts against you, then you should come out swinging about why the test is bad. The test is not binding authority, and so the court has the power to choose to use a different test. So you've got a shot at getting the court to adopt your own test. All right, so we've covered definiteness for design patents. We've covered damages for design patents. And now we'll see if there are any questions. Uh, so one question is, can I file a continuation in part of a prior design application? Um, that is a good question that I do not know the answer to. I know you can file continuations of prior design applications, and in order to get the the uh, or in order to get the priority of the earlier one, you know, there obviously there has to be no new matter, and that's one of the reasons that people like to use dotted lines for a large portion of other design, is because you can just make some other part of it solid line and switch some of the solid lines you had earlier to dotted lines. That's a new design, but you've shown that you possessed it as of that earlier filing. All right, I think that's all the questions, unless somebody jumps in right now. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for today's B2IP webinar. Agent Biedemann is a boutique intellectual property law firm based out of Southeast Michigan. Today's webinar recording will be posted to our YouTube channel, website, and across all of our social media channels. A follow-up email will be sent out shortly with more information on how to obtain CLE credit. Once again, thank you for joining us.